All right, this begins the CESS meeting. We have two topics and two guests to speak with today. The first topic is import assertions and enforceability. Um, Dan Clark is here to talk about that and tells us he has slides. Okay, and hopefully folks are seeing those slides. Uh, let me know if not. Um, cool. Uh, so I'm assuming that like most participants in this meeting have some context about import assertions, what those are. Um, I can happy to give more background. Um, uh, if not, uh, just let me know. Um, but just kind of diving straight into the problem that I wanted to talk about today. Um, this came up during a stage three update uh, for the April TC39 meeting about basically what to do in the scenario where um, the author asserts a type that is something that the host doesn't recognize. Um, the web HTML uh, will always fail the module graph if some module type assertion is present that's not recognized, basically for security reasons. Um, I don't think that's I don't think that's too controversial. But the thing we're trying to sort through is like, should we try to standardize that behavior to where all hosts, if some module type assertion exists, um, should all hosts like fail in that similar way to kind of match the web? Is that something we should standardize, kind of drive alignment to make sure that like code uh, between between the web and between other hosts is as compatible as possible? Um, and kind of a uh, the first crack uh, we took at um, doing that is introducing like a host hook, where the host basically says these are the types of modules I support. Um, JavaScript is assumed, but maybe I support JSON modules, like CSS modules, whatever. Um, it just be a static list that the host gives to ECMAScript. And then based on that list, um, when ECMAScript looks at um, like what module type, when ECMAScript looks at a module type assertion in an import statement, if some unrecognized one that's not in the list is seen, then the import will be rejected. Um, and that's uh, that's pretty much pretty much all there is to it. Um, uh, yes. Uh, is this called once and then the list kept statically, or is this called? Uh, Any time there's a um, uh, there's a novel mod, uh, type uh, to check. This would be, I think, called. My understanding of how this would be is it would be called once. Um, there is like as there are problems with this. I think as like I'll I'll jump into the next slide. But my kind of naive assumption was that this would just be called once um, and then remain static. But um, but but, but so, uh, trying to answer that, uh, Mark. We normally, for the host interaction, we normally don't do any catching. Implementers might do that. Uh, but in the spec, we normally don't have any, that I remember, any, any caching mechanism for um, specific interaction with the host. Mm -hmm. So we do have some in normat, non, well, in pros, around how local module mapping works for a single source text module record. Yeah, I, I, um, so I, I, I think I should clarify, because I, I, I think I like misspoke there. It's like, it's not that it's called once, it's I think when I wrote it in my little draft PR, it's like the language was that every time it's called, it should return the same value. So it's not, it's not cached, yeah. but like it can't change. So um, yeah. I think that's how I currently have it written. So I just, I just yeah. want to put on the table the sort of the obvious other way to state such a thing that's more in line with precedent uh, would be that uh, you ask the host about the, the particular thing you wanted to approve or disapprove. Uh, so you're calling a predicate rather than getting a list. Um, yeah, I, I think that would be kind of closer to what we have have now, where it's like now for each like in host get uh, uh, what's the callback in host resolve imported module. It's like we give the host a specifier and a bag of assertions, and then the host like decides what to do, whether to return abrupt completion or or not, and like that's kind of what we have now. Um, it's like now it's like the call to make is should we be more, uh, should we have more of a limitation on what the host for what they're allowed to do there um, for like assertions they don't support. Um, where like to, to kind of wrap up with where we concluded it, we concluded or didn't conclude at the TC39 meeting, like the, the problems here are like around virtualizability of this. Like for the web, it's like this is kind of straightforward because like the supported assertions like are not really 
not really going to change. Um, but like with other hosts and with with, like with Node and with bundling tools, there might be user specified module types, types that are polyfilled in JavaScript. There might be like a JavaScript implemented loader. They could even do transforms between different types. Um, like an example that came up during the meeting was like maybe I have like like YAML coming off the wire like as the apparent module type, but then there's some transform that turns this into JSON and like when the when the user sees it like it's transformed into JSON and like with interesting cases like this that's like a static list seems like it could it could limit these um, limit these sort of interesting scenarios where I'm implementing a loader in uh, with like JavaScript uh, uh, hooks written by written by an author in JavaScript and like it's not so clear that a static list um, makes sense here um, and it's not so clear whether this sort of restriction on uh, just kind of uniformly blocking all unsupported module types, like even makes sense when you have, uh, when like you can define arbitrary module types in JavaScript in these environments. Um, and so this is like, in terms of like solving this, I'm kind of left with uh, more questions than answers. Like this is a little bit out of my area. Um, so this is kind of where I'd uh, be interested in some guidance on the group from the group in terms of like first, like where where to kind of start in solving this problem or like does this even sound like something that like is solvable or that we want to solve can you, like the can you clarify what the problem is i understand what you're trying yep. to do but you haven't really clarified the actual problem sure um like so the problem is um that like the problem we're trying to solve is like the web um on the web at least there is going to be a behavior where when an author writes some type assertion that is like a random string that's not supported um, like the web has behavior where like that's going to cause the module graph to fail to load um, and the spec the import assertion spec as we've currently written it does not um, um, does not mandate that behavior so other hosts may choose to not do that they may choose to say ignore unknown um, type assertions so the problem uh, would be what we'd like to what we'd like to solve um, would be we'd like to make that behavior uniform between all hosts um, like we would like to have some like we'd like to make the behavior of import assertions as portable as possible so like ideally the unknown type assertions would fail uh, the module load like across all hosts um, an outcome may be that this is not a problem that needs to be solved. Like maybe this is maybe this current behavior is fine and it's just okay not having this be uniform against uh, among all hosts. So like kind of a a like first question to answer is like is this something we even want? Um, and maybe it's not because like it sounds like this could be hard to do. Um, so it's like there's kind of a there's kind of two two questions that I have. Like one is this something that we want to make uniform among all hosts? Like, is it worth it to have like more portability? Um, and then two, like if the answer is yes, like if we really want to do this, um, like how? Uh, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the problem is so, like maximizing uh, portability between hosts. So there, I, I'm gonna just try to explain something about your problem. Um, you're assuming a host has a static list of supported types. Yeah. And that's just not true for Node. Yep. So I don't know if it's a problem because it just doesn't apply for Node. Yep, that um, makes sense. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of the, that was kind of the surprise for me last. The thing I hadn't thought about when this came up during uh, the last TC thirty nine meeting, um, if the um, so like that that would be one like good outcome. Like if there's just if this like there's no way to make this make sense with with Node, then like I think like that would be a clear answer of just like this is not something that makes sense to do um if there's I think, some i think before you get to your current problem you should question if host should not be allowed to have dynamic types if that should be prohibited because this this is all because we are allowed to have dynamic types that are not from the VM, they're yep. from the host. Yeah, I mean, my for like- the web, the web, you're getting dynamic types from CSS and HTML modules. Yeah, but getting the, dynamic. Of what, what does that mean on the web? Uh, I, if you have, and if you import some CSS file 
and then assert that it is CSS. But what you actually get is JavaScript. That's just going to continue on and be a, a compile error, right? Yeah. So in 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 the web, it's like a handshake between the the MIME type of the resource off the wire and the import assertion must agree. Um, so like today, no browsers supports a CSS uh, modules by default. So like there's no way um, like if I um, if I support a type that's not asserted, or if I get like a MIME type that's not a is like supported module type, then I, it's always going to fail. So like there's no scenario today where that would work. Um, if if say once like hopefully CSS modules are supported in browsers, like then it's if I get something a res if I import a resource and the responding MIME type is text that CSS is text CSS, and that import statement asserted that type is CSS, then I load it as a module. Um, as, as I parse it as CSS and I get a style sheet. Um, but if either one of those like isn't the case, if there's a mismatch there, then it then it fails. Whereas in Node, there isn't a potential, there isn't a possibility of a disagreement because the extension and the type are well, the the type is inferred from the extension, right? No, um, that's that complicated. Work? There there can be a mismatch, but we uh, prohibit it currently. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, you know, I'm very glad that the, you put virtualizability up front. Uh, whatever it is that the browser does and whatever it is that Node does, the, uh, the, the, um, the acid test uh, that follows from that is, can the Node behavior be emulated on the browser and can the browser behavior be emulated on the Node, et cetera. So I think, I think virtualizability is going to be, is, is going to be the, the constraint that drives everything else. Yeah. Yeah, like to, to Bradley's earlier question, like about like, is this something that we would like, is this virtualizability uh, something that we would want to not allow for environments like safe or node? Like that seems like that, that's not something I would want to do. Not like kind of naively, like I, that seems like not like something I would want to limit without a really good reason. Um, I consider virtualizability to be a requirement. So, if, if, so, yeah. so there's a difference between virtualizability and having a dynamic set of types. You can still virtualize over a static type mapping. Uh, the uh, if the underlying platform has been launched before the code that decides to virtualize a particular host is loaded, then the decision to virtualize a particular host is happening dynamically. And therefore the, the things that you're allowing has to be something that you're deciding dynamically. I think, I think virtualizability necessarily implies that, um, uh, that this is not a static set. At least I know for the web, they don't want various hooks into their loader. I know for Node, we do provide them. Um, there have been a few attempts to get loader hooks into the web, which have all been rejected in favor of service workers. I don't think we could, at least for root realms on the web, so uh, the, implement virtualizability. So the, I mean, the assumption um, here is, of course, that the compartment API is the, um, you know, the user customizable loader hook that's going to become part of JavaScript uh, and is going to be uh, also the basis for um, uh, JavaScript provided host hooks, uh, enabling one job. You know, compartments are the means by which uh, we arrange for JavaScript code to act as, as emulated host to other JavaScript. By, by yes, the way, Mark, but, uh, I, 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 I barely hear you very far away. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Far. Is this better? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the so the assumption we're making in this group is that the compartment API is the means by which um, JavaScript code acts as host to other JavaScript code and the means by which we achieve host virtualizability. Uh, and uh, it, and in answer to what Bradley just said, also the means by which user customizable loading behavior 
uh, enters into JavaScript and therefore on all JavaScript platforms, including the browser. Yeah, the, the, that's a different, that is a different, um, that is a different place to stand than browsers refusing to ha allow the root realm to modify itself dynamically. Um, the, which is, which is a separable concern, but I think that the, the, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, just to clarify, I was not, I was not advocating that the root realm modify itself dynamically. I was advocating that the, yeah. that, that so, there's dy dynamicity with regard to the platform as a whole, because you can create new realms and new compartments. Bradley, is it the mm -hmm. case that it is, uh, that the node API is a, um, root realm self modification for introducing new uh, not through first class reflection, but yes, not through first class reflection. Uh, well, through what mechanism? Through um... a out of band, uh, well, currently just the CLI argument that you pass in gives you access uh -huh. to instrument it, but it is on the root realm. Yeah. Okay. But it, but it, it is on the root realm, but it is, it is arranged. For by the command line invocation, okay, which is yes. spiritually similar to the virtualized case, or right, where it's a, it's effectively uh, like you could you could arrange the same by having from your root realm creating a child realm and configuring its root compartment with a with an alternate module loader, and that would be spiritually the same. It's not like it's not like monkey patching your module loader from within a module and that's sharing the same module system. Correct. Um, there is a great desire to allow that, though, by yes. the ecosystem that we can't support for a variety of reasons. Yeah, and the web, it, it sounds like the web is, is disinclined to do so. Re regardless, I think that it is that the, the, the virtualization mechanism, either a self mutation or um, the construction of a child realm or compartment, um, is orthogonal to the question of whether the specification should provide this limitation that Dan's proposing. Um, and I think that the, uh, if the motive, so I think that the motivation for the restriction of uh, Dan, let confirm or deny the motivation for the restriction is to create uniformity of, um, it, it, to, to create an ecosystem of portable modules to maximize the amount of portability that exists between browsers, node and other environments. And by creating a limitation on what modules can be, uh, can participate in that ecosystem, that it increases the possible probability that a program written for one system will run on another. Is that right? That's exactly right, yep. Um, so I think that this, yeah, this does, reduced to absurdity, as it were, is if there is, because it is also desirable to have an extensible, uh, extensible assertion system, so that bundlers and node and, and virtualized realms and compartments can all be configured in a way that they accept new types of modules that were not anticipated by TC39. Um, and if that is the case, th those mechanisms will create shards of the ecosystem where where only certain mod modules are supported and i think provided that we have virtualization mechanisms in place in all of these environments that that is okay um and 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 by and contradicts the premise of of having a restriction in the first place yeah i think that's i think that's fair like it's basically like if i'm yeah, if I'm defining my custom module types, like yeah, I'm already not portable. Um, the only, like I, I could like come up with some contrived scenario, like maybe I'm like I'm on some host that like lets arbitrary type assertions, like ignores arbitrary type assertions, and maybe I'm like using that space for like a comment or something, like type like to do like fix this bug, and then that code like works on whatever permissive permissive host and then when i move that like to the web then suddenly it starts failing and i'm surprised because because the other host ignored the arbitrary string in my assertion like i could still like maybe make an argument that like that's bad and we shouldn't allow that but i don't know that's that's kind of contrived so um i don't know i'm 
You you need to be very careful when you talk about things like transforming files. Um, so even on the web, you can use a service worker to transform YAML into JS, for example, and serve it properly under an import. Um, so I think it may be an overreach to try to guard against all those. Um, it's, it's just trying to control things which are not uh, really clear on what you're trying to do. You're trying to control both the assertion prior to the transform and after the transform, um, rather than taking a stance on when it should be applied. And so if you can only transform something into itself, you, you're basically dropping the transform use case. To me, it sounds like a, an extension of an existing problem that um, applications already cannot expect the host environment in which they're running to be consistent. Uh, for example, set immediate might not exist in one environment but might exist in another. This is an extension of that. And if you want to have a more consistent environment for those programs, this has to be a separate effort of these hosts having a baseline uh, agreement on, on what the features they support and provide. Bradley, you mentioned transforms. I am a huge proponent of transforms. I've done module systems with transforms extensively in the past. The, what you're saying about transforms and how they interact with assertions, is that a more general problem that challenges the validity of the concept of import assertions at, at large? No, uh, but it definitely is going to be a surprise if you don't think about them. Um, in general, the type assertion has to be applied prior to the transform, and then you accept anything post-transform, regardless of the actual type. Um, how does that, which how, is how do really, that would in, go ahead, Bradley. Uh, so oh, this wow. is really important um, for things like if you are loading a mixed mode uh, type, so something with higher capabilities than JavaScript for whatever reason, maybe it loads things automatically, does some kind of side effect. Um, when you load it, you want to assert based upon that type. So let's just say we had a type which was bundle and it does a bunch of stuff like it preloads caches and things like that, things that JavaScript can't do. Um, you're actually asserting the type based upon the bundle type, even if the result after the transform results in a source text module record being put into the VM itself. How does like that import assertions, this has to violate the normative text that we put in for import assertions. I tried to get it changed a few times, but whatever. It It's just like the, the normative text is too hard to describe the actual constraints right now. Let, let, me, let me give an example that, uh, that uh, certainly stresses the constraints. I think it supports what Bradley's saying, but let, I'll, 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 let me, I'll just explain it first. Um, in discussing the question in TC39 uh, about importing JSON modules, uh, the, uh, the big controversy that we eventually resolved was whether the uh, imported uh, data should be, should arrive as uh, transitively frozen or all mutable. Uh, and uh, in resolving that it was okay for it to arrive as all mutable, uh, the reason why that was considered acceptable uh, is that uh, in a compartment scenario or you know, in an in a extensible host virtualization scenario where we're controlling uh, imp importing, uh, that uh, when something is importing JSON, a, a loading logic could intermediate to uh, uh, have the, uh, a JavaScript module that does the actual import of the JSON and then hardens it before satisfying the original import. 
And that means that the original import that says that it's importing JSON is actually being satisfied by a synthesized on the fly JavaScript module whose purpose is to import the real JSON and then for, and then harden it. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the case of what's going on here. We actually do this also for things like policies, where you you could try to load a coffee script file or something. You assert the integrity of the source text of the coffee script, not of the transformed JavaScript. Mm. And so you need to do the assertions prior to the transforms, mm -hmm. which violates the spec technically, but eh. yeah, there's, no, there's no way to make import assertions make sense if, yeah. you, if you do it post. Yeah. So in either direction, it, it just doesn't work. I think that we should continue. So for one, I think that Dan, I think that we've answered the questions that you came to have answers for, but if not, and if there's, uh, and, and if there, there's plenty to discuss on this topic, we'd invite you to, uh, to book us, <laughs> book us at a future meeting to, to have, to continue this conversation. Um, there's, a, a, especially if you're interested in having a conversation about how to virtualize, uh, how to how to implement an API that virtualizes import assertions and in, in user space? Uh, I think that that would be a great topic to have as an addendum to this. And I'm happy to see we have Jordan, and we also have just a half an hour to talk. So I'm going to switch over to our new topic, and that is uh, Jordan. Welcome. Thank you. Um. Gosh, let me look at the agenda. This is sure. this is a mandatory caffeine day for me. Sorry, I, I'm also dealing with some family um, struggles today. I'm not out of the ordinary. Um, <laughs> okay, so the, top, uh, the topic is, is, uh, is progress on realms. Um, yeah, so uh, my understanding from the last TC39 meeting is that um, as we, we presented the, the callable boundary realms, we had some remaining challenges uh, that we need to go through and uh, to, in order to, to help advance in the proposal for, the, for stage three. And uh, I know Jordan has some discontent with the current uh, API format and uh, some uh, questions as well on like uh, configuration of the realms and etc. I just want to make sure we give space for Jordan not only to to have these questions uh, addressed, but make sure like if there are any other questions or anything that we uh, that we need to like for us to make sure that we try to answer them or try to uh, what we can adapt and what we should be doing. Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess in, in general, what I'd say is I'm I'm always on board for let's add a little bit now and a little more later, right? Like things that can be, that can evolve over time, right? That's fine. It, it certainly doesn't ever have to be all or nothing. Um, and uh, however, I think that we have to be careful as a committee, C39 does, uh, when we advance something that sort of boxes out other possibilities or when we advance something knowing that other possibilities aren't going, you know, just aren't viable. Um, so the, the primary use case that I have for realms is to get, um, to get clean primordials, right? Like they, it doesn't have to be necessarily the originals, but like, I want to be able to not have to rely on other code in the environment like being nice with array.prototype. I want to be able to just pull out an array.prototype.filter from a realm I control that's either the original one or a polyfilled one, doesn't matter, and then just dot call that safely on you know my arrays. Um, that's that's the way I program all of my like NPM modules is um, I call bind everything at module level. So as long as the environment is clean at the time the module is required, it theor with a few caveats, it's impossible to break my code later by modifying built-ins. 
and I, you know, there's, it's not ergonomic to do, and that's a longer thing that I think should be solved in the language, but um, Realms makes that easier and safer, right? It still, it still has the same timing problem of it has, there's something has to be first run code, but it sort of concentrates, like I just have to create a good Realm at the beginning and then all later code, no matter how much the environment has been screwed with, like in between can use that realm to get to it. So that's sort of my primary use case. It's not my only one. Um, and the general, if, if I see there's a hand raised, if someone wants to interrupt, go I'm ahead. Just, I don't want to interrupt, just, uh, I okay. just want to make sure I, I talk right after you. Cool, cool. Um, but yeah, so then, so that's like sort of my general thoughts and the previous iteration of the realms proposal like gave me that, right? And so I was, I'm happy with it. Um, the, I understand the, interpersonal dynamics that have led to the current compromise. Um, and I heavily empathize with them. Um, the concern I have is that is a, is, is a few things. Number one, um, it does not appear, it does not like it, it basically, does, it does, I have no confidence that a full object, like passing objects back and forth version of realms will ever be allowed to be added. Um, just the, 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 the form of the arguments being presented against that is such that uh, they don't seem, I, I don't believe that those people will ever be convinced that it's a good idea and thus they will block it. So to me, landing some, something that's good enough here means that there's not enough value gained from to override those objections in the future. So I believe if we ship this current thing, that's all we'll ever, we'll ever have more or less, in, at least in the respect that I'm talking about. Um, the other thing is the callable stuff seems really weird and complex to me. And my understanding is that the, the only use case that there is that would be able to use it, the callable thing without any extra libraries is AMP and every, which isn't the web. And everything else, like all the folks on this call would likely have still a, just a different realms library or membranes library or something, sorry, membranes library on top of the callable realms versus on top of whatever there is now. And I get that the implementation of that library might be smaller or simpler or more straightforward or faster. And I get that there are a few things that may be impossible to do without something landing um, uh, no, around so like import hooks and stuff. Yeah, let, let me, let me, yeah. The sure. The membrane library built on top of callable is likely to be more complicated uh, okay. and slower than a membrane library built directly. Uh, however, uh, it will be safer uh, right. in the sense that there's a low level mechanism, the, built, the, the callable mechanism itself that enforces the non-entangling of the object graph. Obviously one very well constructed membrane library can be carefully audited uh, and, to, and verified that it does so as well. Uh, but separating it out into layers is a nice way to gain, to gain confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, Leo, and, uh, to, right. to, be, to be specific there on, on, on that comment, the errors is the, the big one, the errors. Uh, if you have a, a, you're calling a function, whether you're calling through the, the um, for another realm and something throws there, um, you might be able to capture that error. So in order for us to create a membrane with an iframe, we have to be very, very, very careful to not leak those errors from the other side. And that has been in us multiple times. It's very complex. In terms of what, what Mark says, that the, the callable is a, a little bit more complex, that's TBD for me, because the one that I implemented seems like it's not a lot more complex, I would say, about the same, but we haven't had a bunch of other features that we have in other membranes, so we'll have to see how that pan, pan out. Yeah. So, yeah. so that sounds like the, the the complexity of the membrane library is irrelevant, basically. It's that yeah. the, the, this allows better safety, and that's the priority. Yep. Right. This, well, this enforces safety. Just to, to, to make one more elaboration on the user-written membrane is... Uh, if the layering is the better, the better way to get to safety, it's also still the case that a user-written membrane library with no platform support can still be built according to this layering. And then, and then you can still audit the smaller layer 
uh, in order to be confident that the, that the larger layer built on top uh, cannot violate the constraints of the smaller layer. Right. Um, Leo was holding comments at yeah. the end yeah. of Jordan's. Yeah, go ahead, Leo. So, um, yeah, Jordan, I, I, uh, my point of view from uh, what, one of the reasons that we couldn't advance to stage three is that because we have so many uh, of these points that you mentioned out uh, not answered in, in the elasticity of the meeting. I'm trying to capture some of them. Uh, you first talk about the clean primordials. Um, I don't think, yes, I don't think this realm would actually like really be solving this problem right now, um, but it's still- I mean, it, it sort of would in, with the function sense, like, and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna admit that, right? Yes. Like that, that because the reason I'm getting those functions primarily is to call them. <laughs> so as long as I can call them, like it would, it would but I, I'm not sure how the internal slot stuff would work. And, yeah. you know, so that's a, it, but it's possible it could work. It's yeah, too I, I, for you. I, I, <laughs> To to I want to add a comment here. So since you cannot guarantee to be the first one, we all we, we there is always a possibility that someone breaks your code. Uh, that's a side note. But yeah, then, I don't care about being second run code. I can't. Yeah, yeah I can't so do anything. Then we're running we're running at any given time, creating a brand new realm that give you access to those primordials. Is a nice to have with a callable boundary. What you can get is just functions that you export from primordials that you export from inside the realm. Um, at, at that point, I mean, you cannot export the primordial itself. You have to do some wrapping in case that they need arguments or or they return something. So it might be some sort of wrapping. If, if there is uh, only returning primitive values, accepting primitive values. Yeah, you will be able to do that. Operations on arrays and such will not be useful because okay. you have to implement a membrane or something. So I would say that's going to be slower than just using the one that you have at hand uh, on the current runtime. Um, so I would say that if, if accessing primordial, which is something that we have talked in the past, maybe we can introduce a, a different proposal just to access the primordials because Sure. We know that the language holds to then we can access then at any given time if we have some sort of uh, uh, identifier like dollar or whatever similar to what we use in the spec. Maybe some of that might might be something. And by the way, we do exactly the same that you do in all the platform code at Salesforce. We do the same thing, uh, caching all these all these functions that we use to do operations and do helpers around that to not have to do the lookup to make sure that we are uh, resilient to any changes in the system that might affect the code. So we do the same and, uh, and having something like that will also uh, be a benefit for us. Leo? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Leo, go ahead. So uh, let me just try to get back a little, a little bit. Uh, from from my line of talk, yes, uh, the the raise uh, the the bar is raised up as uh, in order to achieve your goals, Jordan. On, on the terms of clean uh, primordials, you still need to get like you're probably gonna need to get like main brains on top of it, and uh, to to get something better. Like yes, because of the the way that are gonna be communicating through functions, etc., to get what you want, you might still need like get main brains on top. Um, that goes uh, to the second part that you mentioned. Um, you're concerned about like future for shipping, transferring uh, objects. Uh, that's something that we discussed at the SAS uh, meeting uh, last week here that I tried to, mm -hmm. uh, to make it clear for, for, for everyone here in the meeting. I'm going to make it again. Um, this is far from uh, like this proposal uh, is really far from getting us satisfied for what we want and our usage. Um, these realms is affecting a hundred percent of Salesforce. That's what I can tell, like from uh, not breaking uh, confidentiality, but uh, it, it affects Salesforce like heavily. Right. Um, and uh, saying that I'm satisfied with just what with this, just the calendar boundaries. Would be naive because we we need more. We we definitely want to expand. I told this to Jack Works. Jack Works totally. wants 
a better ground for configuration of the realms. Yes, we also want that. It's just like we we uh, we're trying to get like to get the whole war we need to pick uh, uh, the battles and uh, get this one started uh, we believe right. we can achieve goals and we believe we can expand from this um uh definitely realms right now doesn't have any configurations bag uh but it's something in, in, in my mind like for what i want to have uh, we have so many other things to explore here uh I was just talking this week to my team about like configuration of proxies that we use mostly on main brains and like how heavy is the usage of proxy and, and how much we can explore uh, config uh, configuring the proxies uh, because that, that also like would bring a lot of impact for the usage of main brains. Uh, we have the usage of main brains themselves like how we can actually extract something to be uh, maybe to, to eventually be native and uh, and get a better understanding. Like we're not doing, we're not trying anything with main brains today because the main brain frameworks as well, they disagree with each other. Like we need to understand like what is the sweet point uh, between them uh, in order to standardize, but we cannot have that with a proper uh, realms API. Um, and the, uh, and uh, just for one of the other points that you mentioned, like the, the main brains are, are as uh, they're, uh, complexity of membranes. Yes, as Karidian Mark has said, uh, they are complex. Uh, and the, the difference, of com difference of complexity doesn't change much, but that doesn't mean membranes are easy today or going to remain easy. They are complex today. They're very high bar for everyone to get uh, used to. Um, we still get like uh, to stop and have sessions uh, with people who are starting uh, working with membranes. Uh, it takes them like uh, uh, some time to get an understanding of how membranes work and what we need to do with membranes. Like people actually ask like how membranes work. This is a very often question. Uh, and this is a very high bar. And we recognize that. That's one of the things that I'm saying. Like, yes, we, we definitely need um, to work in uh, like how we actually, uh, actually expand that. I think one of the things is actually bringing this case as main brains are very complex, bringing it back to like use cases that we just need uh, usage of clean primordials, not exactly just having a virtualized context, a virtualized global uh, object. Um, today, you can still like inject uh, things through import. I think that's uh, like one of the most powerful things of the callable boundaries because you can still execute code there in an isolated form. Uh, that you can still extract the values, uh, but and you can extract the values from there through callbacks in, in a synchronous manner. Um, but you you definitely there's there is more there is more of course. Um, I just need to get this step in because uh, the pushback from uh, some uh, implementers are really is strong uh, for this because this is not like their use case. Like they actually have this use case in another uh, nature form. I see realms today, like as for uh, as we use as a, the Salesforce as a platform, we have too many plugins. We have like clients plugins, and you, we have a marketplace that you can import these plugins. Um, this is one of the examples. It's not. It's not like uh, even like half of the usage of what we we have for realms. Um, and for browsers, you have the browser as a platform and the extensions. And the extensions they operate in some uh, uh, synchronous communication as well, but in some sort of like isolated way. The browsers already solved their uh, use case for this. Uh, we need to solve our use case as like having our applications as a, as a platform for many users too. Uh, and yes, there is much more to explore from here. Um, I think we have more people on the queue, but I hope this actually like brings uh, more. Thanks to the discussion and yes, Jordan, I know the time's short. Let's continue the discussion here. I hope we can actually unblock this for, for July. Uh, Mathieu? Yeah, uh, first I wanna say there are actually some use cases today um, that where global uh, realms help uh, without membranes. For example, a test render being able to just execute code as Leo just mentioned in a clean environment and just tear it down after. Um, Regarding the your use case of access to uh, the primordials, I guess if you don't need 
access to the objects, but just the functions themselves. Uh, as uh, Carrie mentioned, maybe we should uh, look into um, a new API to get access to the original uh, prim uh, primordials uh, like that. Um, it seems we've had a similar but different need uh, for this, for being able to discover all the object primordials uh, that might be hidden so that they can be um, uh, frozen and, uh, and, and passion in SES uh, shim. Um, so uh, maybe it's something to explore uh, for that use case. Yeah, um, it, it just to pile on an agreement, I think that all of everyone in here would be satisfied with the original realm proposal, which gives direct access to objects. Um, uh, of course, it, and for most, but and also for most use cases, I think we're also satisfied by this incremental callable boundary. Uh, though I'm obviously sympathetic to, I am sympathetic to the shimming case where you want to get a genuine original from from your realm, uh, from a child realm. The that being said, that doesn't eliminate your vulnerability to the code that ran before you because somebody could be very clever and construct a and replace your realm constructor with something dastardly um, or, or merely clever in the best case. The, but, but really the argument that I find, I, I, I think I'd like you to think more about is, is that there are two premises for blocking. One of which is uh, that advancing the callable boundary realm diminishes the marginal value of a genuine realm um, the other premise is that the, the, the cost of passing, uh, of, of, of TC39 landing a genuine realm is effectively infinite at the moment with the people in the room at the moment, um, which I think negates the marginal value argument. Is that, that the, just, uh, it's, it's that, well, for one, I think that the premise that it's that it's impossible to overcome the people in the room is is not necessarily true because the people in the room change uh, over decades. So, so never, never is never is 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 too big. But de this decade is probably definitely true. <laughs> um, the but but the cost is uh, but the cost is the bigger the, the bigger issue. We're not going to well, make that. Well, so I think. How I would respond to that is that um, effectively, like not forever, but let's say for 10 years, which is close enough for, this, for these purposes, uh, without some change in position, this is, I think this is effectively all we'll get uh, in, in, towards direct object access. Um, I am not convinced that this is better than nothing in that case. Meaning I think that this adds complexity to the language that is not warranted at all unless we can move towards direct object access. That seems to also contradict the premise that there is some, that some use cases are solved by callable boundary that are, that are, uh, that, that could also be solved by direct access, but, but are also solved by the callable boundary. So the value is not zero. True. There might also be offset by some, some negative, I, I'll grant. Um, right. Is, is I, I mean, that, like we've about... seen a lot of things that are ha ha like low level capabilities added to JavaScript. I think that um, I understand why they're important, like proxy or uh, SIMD if it had progressed or typed arrays and so on. But like their existence creates confusion and like causes problems in the language. And sometimes uh, it is not like retroactively, it, it's, some of these things aren't always worth it. And I, th this callable stuff is sufficiently weird and complex to me that it feels like it will be in that bucket very soon. And given that all, like all, all the folks in this room are the ones who are like interested in realms advancing. And my understanding is it's primarily for membrane use cases. It's like, it's not actually like, adding a capability it is increasing some safety like from what mark said but like maybe there's other ways to do that i don't know i, I haven't put the time in to think about it but like the i and i and the other thing is I, i'm particularly 
baffled, I guess, that uh, the argument that something is a foot gun is being successfully used to eliminate it entirely. Whereas for me, it seems like that is only and ever an argument for it not being the default behavior. Yeah, just to make my position clear, uh, as I said, I think this layering is a very clever way to get confidence that the separation is preserved, but it doesn't need to be in the platform. I think the insight of the layering can be mm -hmm. embodied in how you structure a membrane library that would achieve the same safety goal. The difference is uh, whether the safety is enforced by the platform or is something that is chosen by choosing a library. Uh, and I think that the, uh, um, I think that the, the foot run argument uh, is addressed by having there be safe library choices. Uh, in order for the platform to be a, a motivated uh, safety measure, uh, it has to be, you have to do that in terms of who is being protected by whom. And I don't think there's a who is being protected by whom story here that um, justifies forcing the safety to be provided by the platform. So, so I'm remaining in the position that the reason we're talking about putting in the platform is not a technical virtue, it's the political issue. Uh, that said, it's a political issue I'm willing to go with. Uh, Bradley, your cue. Sure, so um, I don't know how much people know about Node's self-hosted JavaScript, but it is increasingly a mess for a variety of reasons to get robustness uh, without a membrane, intentionally without a membrane um, uh, for major performance problems. Even just using the originals, once you wrap them, they're also performance problems in JavaScript. At least with, if we did have realms, we could only cross that barrier once at the input and output boundaries for APIs. Right now we have to guard every single JavaScript operation that we do. So there's some interesting coding patterns that emerge because of that. Um, at least in that case with realms, we, we could implement that boundary safely, but we would still do effectively what callable boundaries do, even, even if we had object access in node core. Um, because we can't allow taint to cross into the internal side of things. So I think callable boundary is okay for nodes use case. I think it serves it well. That's all I had to say. Yeah, you know, I'd like to add a few things. Uh, we have only a few minutes, but so I, I will not characterize this proposal as a primary use case uh, being the membrane uh, for software, obviously membrane is important, virtualization is important, but, but I will not characterize that, the, the proposal as such. The proposal is about having a different global object. You want to have a different global object with the capabilities of the language there. Uh, it all depends on what you want to do with the program that you want to run inside that realm. And if that program is supposed to communicate directly with the incubator realm uh, with complex structures, then you have to bring something into the table. If the program is just providing primitive values and interacting with the incubator with primitive values, this is a, a fine solution. Whatever you're doing there, if you just spinning up a plugin there that receive uh, numbers and produce uh, numbers on the other end, that works just fine. It's similar to any other uh, primitive values. And even when we have uh, records and tuple, it will be a lot, lot more useful, I would say. Um, but as a very low level thing, is it's, it's going to be very interesting to see what people will do with that. Uh, similarly to what happened with proxies. Yeah, proxies add a lot of complexity to the language, but they open so many doors that we haven't even explored yet. That I would say that it is a net positive value that, that was added to the language, not a, a, not, not a negative value. Uh, and I will, I will argue that the realms, even with the call of a boundaries, will, will be very similar to that. I, I'm eager to see what people will come up with once they start 
using this and exploring what kind of things they can do. I imagine that people will be writing libraries that will be just a facade that runs in the uh, in the um, in the incubator realm that allows interaction via primitive values or some sort, and then it delegates all the operations to the other realm, which is the same process, uh, uh, accessible really quickly. There's no delay on using any of these or performance penalties on using any of these if what you're dealing is with with uh, numeric values or some sort. Like could you imagine like a, any any game engine or something that just interacting with very primitive values that can run in a realm just fine. Um, so you create a facade with the public API, you, you create interaction with the code that runs inside, inside the realm and so on. So it, I, would, I would say, yeah, uh, membranes is a, a, a thing that we want to explore, virtualization is a thing that we want to explore. Some of these people in this call will explore that for sure, but it's, it's not near to be the primary use case for everyone else. Um, um, so I, I wanted to clarify on that. And then uh, as, as Chris was saying, uh, I, I totally disagree that this is uh, worse than having nothing. Uh, right now, just having to interact with the iframe to do operations is just very hazardous. It's very complicated. Um, and, and having this open the door for doing a lot of other things at a very co low cost. Yep. Um, I think that, well, for one, we're at time. Um, thank you very much for coming, Jordan. Uh, I think that everyone here feels more heard than they were a half an hour ago. Um, and uh, yeah, and if we uh, if, if there's some benefit for follow-up conversation, please do not hesitate to, to reach out to us to put some more time for this. Um, yeah, and this is a good just the regular time conflicts for the first half hour, so and it's tight the last half, so I can try again next week or a future week if there's more to talk about. All right, I'll um I'll keep I'll keep an ear open for uh for a time slot if ne if needed. And um, again, thank you also Dan and and compatriots on on behalf of type assertion or pardon import assertions. Um, looking forward to having more conversations about that in the future as well. Uh, yeah, and that's time. I'm gonna stop the recording. Thank you. <laughs>